Good morning all and a very, very warm welcome to Emmanuel Church, particularly if you're joining us for the first time. Uh, it's really lovely to have you with us. My name is Justin Osmond and I'm on the leadership team here at Emmanuel and I'll be leading the service this morning. So I don't know about you, but uh, for me this week has felt something like a, a turning point in what we've all been going through in the last year. Um, with the Prime Minister's announcement on Monday of a pathway to a return to a large degree of normality. And whilst it might not uh, work out exactly to the timing um, that the Prime Minister stated, um, it's coming over the horizon. And what with the, uh, the lovely weather we've been having over the last few days, it's just felt like a real boost to my spirits. Um, so I want to start this service this morning just by um, briefly giving thanks. Father God, we just want to thank you for bringing us through this, um, this terrible time. And we want to thank you that the, the end appears to be in sight. And we know across the world that might mean still a very long, world to, uh, a long way to go. But we know in this country with the rollout of the vaccine and um, all of the measures and um, uh, the work that everyone's been doing to keep us safe, that we seem to be turning the corner. And we want to give thanks for the NHS staff that have made that possible, that have protected us throughout this pandemic and uh, administered to those who were sick. We want to thank you for the scientists who contributed to the vaccine and the rollout of the vaccine, which is going so amazingly well. And we want to thank you for all of the blessings that you give us. And we just ask that you would continue to, to bless us as we move forward and um, uh, keep your blessing over this pathway to a return to normality for everyone. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Today. I'll now hand over to Paul, who's going to lead us in worship. Hello, everyone. Good to have you here. Just come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at his feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven conquered the grave you free every captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. Cause your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah. 
the grave you free every captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awaken alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things you have done great things god you
in his hands Oh praise the sun He died and rose again For all my days My soul will praise him For all my days My soul will praise him The cup was not removed He drank it all See him hanging there Where I belong our adoration Jesus Lamb of God receive our adoration how wonderful you are receive our our adoration how wonderful you are and every soul you sing sings out everything you make resounds oh creation
Thank you so much, Paul. So I'll be handing over to Richard in a moment, who's going to lead us in prayers, and then uh, Josh, who's going to bring us our reading before uh, Paul Collins speaks to us. But before I do that, perhaps we could just take a moment to prepare our hearts. Father God, I ask that you would uh, come and be with us this morning, that you would um, inhabit our space wherever we are, and we know that we're not able to meet together, although hopefully it won't be too long before we can, but come and meet with us in our individual homes and speak to us clearly through uh, what Paul has got to say. We ask that we would um, leave this service um, knowing what you wanted to say to us and better equipped for whatever the, uh, the week ahead may hold and go uh, able to shine your light into this world which needs you so much. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Over to you, Richard. As we come to our time of prayer, let us be still, breathe slowly, and just focus our hearts and minds on God and follow on in the strength of our 24-1 prayer gathering. So let us give thanks and praise to the Lord. Our Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise for all your gifts to us, the gift of your love, your forgiveness, your Son, whose perfect life is an example for us all, and whose death on the cross and glorious resurrection gave us the promise of new and everlasting life through faith in him. I oh, thank you for your Holy Spirit, who you have sent to be with us and to guide us in our daily lives. Lord, as we pray, renew in us the power of your Holy Spirit and give us the strength, courage and understanding to do your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for our church and our community. So we pray for our church here at Emmanuel we lift up to you our clergy and all those in leadership. We ask that you fill them with your Holy Spirit. Empower them with the gifts to fulfill their ministry. Protect and provide for them and their families. Give them the wisdom and discernment to lead us through this time of pandemic restrictions and into the place of growth for your kingdom here in Chichester and to a time soon when we can all meet together again in person to praise your mighty name. Lord, we pray for Christians around the world, particularly those who suffer because of their faith in you. Lord, we know your strength is greater than any threat of man, but we ask for your special protection for our brothers and sisters in hostile countries. We pray for our shops, businesses, and community enterprises in and around our city. That, you'll soon, that they will soon be able to return some, to some normality and help lift the lockdown cloud that has uh, endured for so long. We pray for our hospital at St Richard's and all the staff that work there. We give you thanks for their dedication and during all the pressures of the pandemic. And we pray that you continue to sustain them in their work. Oh, we also pray for all our teachers with the imminent return of pupils to school and all the extra pressures of assessments in place of GCSE and A-level examinations. We pray for protection and a great blessing on them for all the work that uh, they'll have to do through these exceptional times. Lord, in your infinite love and mercy, we raise our church and community to you. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our world and our world leaders. We pray that you grant the leaders of the nations the wisdom, courage and insight to act with clarity of vision to guide the world into the paths of justice and peace. We focus at this time, Lord, on the needs of poorer nations for the success of the World Health Organization COVAX program. 
for the fair and rapid distribution of the COVID vaccine around the world. Lord, help world leaders to work together in generosity of spirit to make a success of the programme and make the world a safer place to live. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for our family and friends and those in need of healing. Lord, we lift to you our family and friends and ask for your blessing on them that they may come closer to you and know your love and be filled with the joy and real goodness of life that comes from walking with you. We ask that you come close to families who are under stress and have particularly heavy worries. Help them to hold close together and to feel the comfort and strength of your love in their lives. Be especially close to those that have lost loved ones. Comfort and restore them in their time of grieving, we pray. Lord, we ask for your healing for those we know who are sick or troubled. Let's just spend a few moments of quiet to pray for those that come to mind and give their name to the Lord in the quietness of our hearts. Father, we lift to you those we have named and ask that you anoint them with your healing power, make them whole and return joy and peace to their lives. In your mercy, hear our prayer. So gathering our prayers and praises into one, let us pray as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. This reading is from Genesis chapter 18, verses 16 to the end. When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him, for I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, and their sin so grievous, that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are fifty righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of fifty righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, If I find fifty righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than fifty? Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five people? If I find forty-five there, He said, I will not destroy it. Once again, he spoke to him. What if only forty are found there? He said, for the sake of forty, 
I will not do it. Then he said, May the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only thirty can be found there? He answered, I will not do it if I find thirty there. Abraham said, Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only twenty can be found there? He said, For the sake of twenty, I will not destroy it. Then he said, May the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only ten can be found there? He answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left, and Abraham returned home. Well, good morning, and... Uh... It's great to be with you this morning. For those of you uh, who uh, have not met me before, my name's Paul, I'm the minister here at Emmanuel, and it's, it's really good to be able to come and speak to you this morning. Thank you for joining us. We've been looking at a series recently on the book, uh, or on the life of Abraham as told in the book of Genesis, right at the beginning of the Bible. And uh, you've heard this passage read to us today about the story of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and the uh, the conversation that happens between God and Abraham. And, I, and I, as I read it, I find that actually this, this story is quite appealing. It sort of draws us in. And I think there's a reason for that. And I think it's because of the relationship between Abraham and the Lord and the image that's being painted about this relationship. And I think when we when we think about people of the Bible and we think of people that had a, an, an intimate relationship with the Lord, we often go to people like Moses who who spent time in the Lord's presence, or David, or, or, or obviously uh, the disciples spending time with with Jesus. <coughs> but I think Abraham's got a really interesting relationship here because it's it's a real conversational relationship. It's it's a relationship between friends. So uh, if we go to the beginning of this story, last week Martin spoke to us about the, the, the visit that Abraham and his wife Sarah had, had by these three uh, heavenly beings, whether they were the Lord himself, and I suspect at least one of them was, uh, or and the rest the other two were angels, as the book of Genesis we later on in this the rest of the story find out it probably is the Lord and two angels visiting Abraham and Sarah. We find that they've just had this uh, meeting. They've just entertained the Lord. They've fed him. They've had a conversation. The Lord has spoken into their life, something about prophetically speaking into their life and prophetically blessing them. And the Lord and the angels decide to, uh, to leave. And then uh, Abraham gets up and starts to walk with him and sort of to see him off, the Bible says. And I think that's just such a great image because he actually harps back to the right at the beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve would walk with the Lord in the garden. And of course, when Adam and Eve uh, ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the Lord was walking in the garden expecting to find Adam and Eve walk, to walk with them. And they weren't there, they were hiding because of the shame that they felt. But here the, the Abraham walks with the Lord and, and walks off. And I remember it makes me think about uh, one of those occasions when I was growing up and we'd have friends or family coming to visit us, maybe our grandparents or my uncle and aunt and cousins coming for, uh, to spend the day with us. And at the end, uh, you may have done this when you were growing up. Uh, they would get in the car and they would start to drive off and they would drive off slowly. And me and my brothers, we would run down the road and we'd be waving and running after them and chasing them. But ultimately, because we didn't really want them to go, but we were sort of seeing them off and, and saying goodbye to them and spending as long as we possibly could with them before they finally went. And you get that impression with Abraham. He wanted to spend every last moment of time with the Lord before the Lord finally left. So he was walking with him and it paints that image of the walk that Adam and Eve have had with the Lord in, in Genesis. 
and the Lord walked with Abraham. It's that reminder of, uh, of the Garden of Eden. And of course, walking with the Lord is a, a theme that appears regularly in the Bible. And actually, it's really what we're called to do as Christians, to walk with the Lord, to walk with the Lord. Conjures up that image of relationship. And actually, it is the relationship that we are supposed to have with him. I think the problem is most of us treat our relationship with God, and I count myself in that as well, that it's more like a phone call. Yeah, you know, we, we, when, we, when we're in trouble, we'll pick up the phone and we'll dial the number and say, you know, Lord, uh, in this situation, help. Or Lord, I'd like you to do this for me. Or Lord, uh, it's great to be able to chat, but uh, you know, EastEnders is on in 15 minutes. Let's get this over and done with uh, and we can, I can get back to my life. And at the end of it, thanks very much. See you, amen, bye. Hang up. And actually, the image of a walk, it's a lifelong journey where we walk with the Lord and it's the conversation. And I often find in particular uh, when dealing with men and and talking with men, some of the best conversations you have is when you're out walking with them. They really start to open up. They start to engage a lot more about their feelings and, and what's going on in their lives rather than just sitting them down and having a face-to-face chat with them. And there's that, there's that sort of image of the comfortableness of the conversation and the depth of the conversation that happens through walking. And it's a lifelong journey. That's the relationship that you and I are called to, to, to walk with the Lord daily throughout our lives, walking with him, just talking with him as if he's there beside us and to engage with him. Not that sort of conversation between a pen pal or over the phone or or worse still on one of the social media sites. Over and done within seconds, bosh, gone. It's a lifelong conversation. So Abraham's walking with him and just trying to see him off, to spend every last minute before he finally leaves. And then they look towards Sodom and Gomorrah. And of course we know that Sodom and Gomorrah has a bad reputation. It's a place of real uh, debauchery. It's full of uh, repulsive behavior that the Lord just cannot stand. And he looks at it and, and, and the Bible records, it's almost a monologue that the, God, that the Lord is having with himself and says, shall I reveal to Abraham or shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? And the Lord decides to reveal to Abraham exactly what he's planning to do. He says, I want to find out exactly what's going on in there. I'm going to find out because it's been brought to my attention that there is some real evil there. And I want to find out. I want to establish the truth. And then I'm going to deal with it. And I lo- that's quite interesting. Shall I hide from Abraham or shall I tell him what's go- what I'm about to do? And of course, we know, in because we read the whole story, that the Bible, uh, that the Lord does reveal to, to Abraham. But it's interesting that the Lord even considers it. He thinks about this and, and thinks, what are the pros and cons? And of course, the Lord shares with Abraham for a reason. Now, what are those reasons? Why does the Lord feel it necessary to share with Abraham, a mere human, that what his plans are? Well, it's because of relationship. Because the Lord wants relationship with with us and he wanted relationship with Abraham. And he's thinking, if I want relationship with Abraham, Abraham's got to know what I'm like. He's got to know what he's sort of getting into. He's got to, he's got to understand something about the, the mate that he's going to have in me. And, and this is my character. One, I cannot stand sin. It's repulsive to me. Abraham needs to know that. Abraham needs to know that I am holy and that sin is really upsetting to me and I, and I cannot abide it. So that's really important. He needs to know that. He needs to know I'm really powerful. In fact, I'm all powerful. I can deal with this. If it's a problem, I can deal with it. But as we later go on to see, he also wants Abraham to know, but I might, sin might be repulsive. I might be all powerful, but I'm merciful. There is possibility for mercy in the conversation. And the fourth thing, Abraham, I'm open for the conversation. Let's talk. 
And that last one is really, really significant. And, and church, we need to hear that today, that the Lord is open for conversation. Now, I, uh, like many of the people that uh, are parents that have children at school nowadays, tend to get lots of emails from teachers. Uh, none of them are complaining about the behavior of my children, but you get all the emails coming through saying, oh, your child has got this award for a number of house points or putting incredible, incredible load of effort into this subject. And so I get a little uh, email from it, a little certificate. They might say, well done. Uh, uh, this week we got one for Noah. Well done, Noah. You put a lot of effort in this term that's been reflected in your report. Uh, well done on behalf of Mr. Jackson, deputy head at uh, Bishop Ruffer. Now, when Noah comes home, Noah comes home bursting through the door and, and wants to share the fact that he's been recognised at school for, uh, for doing, really good, uh, doing really well, putting a lot of effort into his subjects. Now, I have a choice as a parent. I can either go, yeah, I, I already know that. Or I can sit there and pretend not to know so that I can enjoy the conversation, so that I can enjoy his joy at sharing with me. And you know what? That's what the Lord does. There's a scene in the shack where uh, Mac is having a conversation with uh, the Father, the Son and, and the Spirit and, and they're over dinner and they're laughing and, and Mac makes a comment says, but you, you already know what I'm about to say. Uh, and the, the Holy Spirit looks at him and says uh, something along the lines of, yes, yes, Mac, we do, but we choose to ignore that so that we can enjoy the conversation with you. Yes, the Lord is all-knowing. There's that theological construct of him being omniscient. He knows everything, but he is relational. And it's because of the relationship that he has, he chooses sometimes to, to ignore his omniscience so he can enjoy the presence of conversation. He can enjoy the reality of conversation. He can enjoy the joy he gets through engaging with him. Otherwise, the Lord would just go, yeah, I know that. Yeah, I know that. I know that. And, and we would very quickly go, this is a boring conversation to be having. Everything I say, he already knows. And the Lord doesn't want that. He wants the conversation. So the Lord chooses sometimes to, to sort of ignore his omniscience so that he can enjoy the present reality of conversation. And that's what he does with Moses, uh, Abraham here. He chooses to ignore what Abraham is about to say and about to do so he can enjoy the conversation. And, and Abraham can learn some lessons here. So the Lord gets the report from the angels and says it's awful. So the Lord starts to say, right, I'm going to destroy that. And Abraham comes back and said, but if there are righteous people are in there, would you do that? Would you sweep it away if there's, say, 50 people there? And the Lord says, OK, no, if there's 50 righteous people, I'll leave it. So Abraham starts to realise that actually, not that he's onto a winning streak here, but actually he starts to think, oh, maybe there aren't 50 people in here. Maybe there are only 49. And by saying 50, I've just, you know, I've just annihilated, annihilated them. So he then has a convers another conversation and he carries on and he says, uh, well, uh, what, 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 if, uh, uh, what, what if the number is, say, 45? And the Lord says, if there's 45, I won't destroy them. And, and, and Abraham keeps going. He keeps going like this. And he, he says, uh, what if there's a, eventually he cuts to number 10. He says, what if only 10 can be found? Will you destroy it then? Because what does that say about you? And the Lord says, no, if there's 10, I won't destroy it. So the Lord has enjoyed the conversation. He's enjoyed Abraham pushing back. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us that A, we can engage with the Lord with conversation and the Lord is prepared at times to change his mind. He is prepared for our prayers to make a difference. That's why we pray, people, because our prayers make a difference. They can change the heart and mind of God when we pray. We see it here. God was going to destroy 50. Abraham engages in petitions and intercedes for these people. 
and eventually gets it down to the 10. As it happens, there aren't even 10. I shan't ruin next week's story. There aren't even 10. But the conversation is had and God's heart changes. God says, no, okay, if we get it down to 10, I won't annihilate them. I will save them. So conversation, it's all about relationships. So that's what this passage is about. It's about a beautiful walk between Abraham and God. And it's about a conversation, a conversation where the Lord chooses to lay aside everything he knows so he can enjoy the present reality of the conversation. That's what the Lord does with you. It's what the Lord does with me. When we say, Lord, the Lord's already there. He's going, what? What are you about to say? Of course, he could already go, yeah, I know what you're about to say. But he goes, what are you about to say? Tell me, tell me what's on your lips. Tell me what's in your heart. I want to know it. It brings me joy to hear it from you. That's the beauty of prayer. And then when we, when we speak to him, he goes, okay, you have a point. I'm prepared to change my mind. I'm, not always. He is, after all, God. He can do what he wants. But prayer means at times he says, no, I, I'll change my mind. I'll do it as you want. So we're called to walk with the Lord on a day to basis. God is not someone at the other end of a telephone. He's someone that walks with us and, in, and wants that daily constant conversation. It's just friends walk along and share with each other. But sometimes when Lou and I go for a walk, we don't need to talk to each other. Sometimes we just walk and then just enjoy being together uh, and don't say a thing. And that's OK. God's OK with just your presence. He doesn't need a constant conversation. He just enjoys your presence. But he wants to be there constantly with you, walking with you. And he wants you to walk with him. And he wants you to start to get to know him. To realise his character as Abraham started to learn his, the character of God. And more importantly, that as we bring our thoughts, our concerns, our prayers to him, it makes a difference. That's what we pray. That's why we pray. Because prayer changes our current reality and our future. God bless. Thank you so much, Paul. Well, if there's anything that's spoken to you uh, through this morning's service or indeed over the last days or, or weeks, uh, we've got an amazing team of people who would love to pray with you um, who are waiting online at the moment. All you need to do is uh, follow the Zoom link on our website and um, uh, they'll then take you into a breakout room and can pray with you for whatever's on your heart. Alternatively, if you just want to catch up with uh, people or get to know some of the church family, then as usual, we've got our church, uh, we've got our um, Zoom coffee straight after the service. Um, so go away, make yourself a coffee for five minutes, then come back, follow the Zoom link and uh, catch up with friends or get to know uh, some new people. Uh, one of the great joys of that for me has been um, Actually, you never know who you're going to be talking to, uh, you know, getting split out into, into small groups. And it's been lovely to get to know some of the church family that I haven't spent uh, time or a lot of time talking to before. So it would be lovely to see you there. And also with the thought that we don't yet know when we're going to be able to meet in person again back at uh, Bishop Leffer. But we're all longing for that day to come round um, as soon as possible. Um, so we'll keep you updated uh, as soon as we're able to. Um, to get back live servicing, um, we will do, um, and you can expect um, an announcement uh, as soon as we're able to do that. So I hope you have a, a very good week and um, look forward to seeing you again soon. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, Amen.